everyone and welcome. My name is Baria Gorin and I am the Interim Academic Director and Clinical Associate Professor for the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department in the Division of Programs in Business here at NYU School of Professional Studies. I am so excited to welcome you all to this event, which is part of the leading global growth series that is led by one of our highly esteemed faculty members, Professor Ben Arroyo. And today we are very honored to welcome Mike Gladstone from Pfizer, former global president, inflammation and immunology. Welcome everyone. Before I hand it over to Professor Ben Arroyo, I wanted to give a quick introduction on us for those of you that are joining us from outside of NYU. Um, the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department, we are so proud to say that we are a diverse and global community of students, scholars, professionals, and educators. We strongly believe that brands and professionals in marketing and PR have a key role to play in driving business growth, and we have a responsibility in positively influencing societies and economies in a sustainable and equitable way. Our practice of marketing and PR is both human-centered and data-driven. We are also a large group. We are technically the largest, or not even technically, we are the largest in the country that is specifically focused on marketing and PR uh, in terms of giving um, graduate degrees. And we are around 1,200 students in the program across the cohorts with more than 200 faculty members that are practitioners and leaders in the industry. With that said, I will hand it over to Professor Ben Arroyo Thank you again for joining us today. Well, hey, I've been doing this for over two years now. And this is the first time ever that we do it without a mask. And it's a few coincidence with Pfizer. For those of you who are joining remotely, welcome. I'm George Benaroya. During the day, I work as a CFO. I started my career at Procter & Gamble, then Tetra Pak, Nivea, and now I work in private equity. Now, once per week, I get to do something I love, and this to teach this class. Now, we are not actors. These are real students. You join a real class going on now live at NYU's School of Professional Studies. And I'll show you and explain what, what's going on. Phil, will you show the slides? So what students do the first session is they pick a company, any company they want, and they pick Pfizer. And then each week, they learned about finance by learning one thing or making one business decision. So this is the first session that, that uh, they took together. Now, the first uh, assignment that they have is about headcount. How would you persuade your boss at Gladstone to let you hire more marketing people? This is how Anisha did it. What would you do if you don't have enough product to sell? That's the situation that we have still with supply chain. Would you prioritize old clients or new clients? It's interesting that before the pandemic, on the left-hand side, students were picking new clients to make more money. But during the pandemic, on the right-hand side, no one did. Now, for Pfizer, was real tricky. And this is what Hessian did. And then we'll have one of the students asking Mr. Gaston, what would he do in a situation like this? What would you do about inflation? How much would you increase prices? This would mind you that you increase prices by 5%. Now, there are no right or wrong numbers in the class. The idea is to learn how to use numbers in a meaningful way to persuade others. Oh, she's not in my class. <laughs> What would you do if someone reacts like her when you increase prices? So what students did is they came up with a number of strategies, the four of them, to present or to explain to consumers why we were increasing prices. And then the last step is we invite global executives who make all these decisions in real life on a daily basis to show us how, we, how they do it. And today with us is Mike Gladstone, the global president, at Pfizer. He's also the US, um, US president elect of the Leadership Council and a member of the executive committee representing pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers, the pharma industry in general. Now, I like to make introductions a bit more personal until if you want to 
that's what the slide shows. And look, what I try to do is I try to find speakers who will genuinely motivate others. And that's when I thought about Mr. Gladstone. This last night, he was so kind to send me a message and tell me, listen, don't worry about the weather. I'll make it tomorrow. Wouldn't you like to have a boss like that? Yeah. This is what one of his colleagues said about him. More than a mentor, Gladstone is a sponsor who speaks your name in a room full of opportunities. This is the best in people and is extremely generous with his time, devoting hours and hours to coaching people and instilling in them the confidence they need to succeed. These people end up doing great things and becoming leaders themselves because Gladstone believe in them and saw their potential. Please join me to welcome Mike Gladstone. <laughs> That was from my mom, by the way. <laughs> we doubt it. <laughs> so what we do in these sessions is students will ask all the questions themselves. I would just ask the first one to sort of break the ice. And Phil, maybe you could put that slide. So Pfizer is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world. And what we would like to know is, if you're a global president, what do you do? And also, what was it like during the pandemic to work at Pfizer? Yeah, thank you for the question. I will uh, hopefully try to do a better job answering it than I did with my daughter. So when we were working at home during the pandemic, she got to see me work and I was out of the house. She's like, you got to tell me what you do, because by the way, she's listening today. She just held in. So I wasn't nervous until that point. No. But she said, you know, you're basically talking on the phone all day and having a good time. You know, what exactly do you do? So I'm going to try to do a better job now than I did back then. So first of all, it's a real privilege. I've had uh, two of these jobs, uh, global president jobs when I was with Pfizer. And one was internal medicine, one was inflammation and immunology. And it's a real privilege to work with colleagues around the world who are purpose-driven, highly motivated, excellent colleagues. And our mission was to end the suffering for patients who have debilitating or disfiguring conditions. And that was really our North, store, North Star. Specifically, my last role in inflammation I had a, a group of colleagues, a couple thousand colleagues who were deeply focused on debilitating diseases like gastro, some in gastroenterology, some in dermatology, and some in rheumatoid arthritis. So I was responsible for 58 countries. And so, you know, the, the question is, what do you do when you take over a group like that? What's job one? Job one is understanding the vision and the purpose. Where are we going and what's our reason for being here? And so to do that, we've got a head of research that I would work with, the head of clinical trials, all of our marketing colleagues get together and together we would jointly come up with the strategy and reinforcing our purpose. And then it's at that point when you start to roll that out to the rest of the organization and create that, create that vision. Now, during the time after you do that, one of the things you do is you want to create an environment, probably the second most important thing that I did, an environment where everybody can excel. It's easier said than done. That's about culture spend a tremendous time on that and having people feel empowered. And during the course of that, the teams would, the group of physicians would pre present a plan and the marketers would present a plan. And I would look at that plan. We would engage with the leadership team, challenge it many ways, revise to come up with the best plan possible. And then, um, you know, that's where we would focus our time and ultimately try to knock down the barriers that are in their way. So during these discussions, you run into internal barriers or external barriers. I try to wipe those away. That's my, my, my main job. I'll tell you an example that probably illustrates it the best. This was a while ago. It was a leadership course. Um, I was with a company that was ultimately bought by Pfizer. So it was a Pfizer company. And they took about 50 of us and got us up at four in the morning. It was a leadership development class. Drove us to Trenton, New Jersey, to a place in the middle of the night. It was pouring down rain where nothing was. They dropped us off and we're in raincoats. And they told us, here's the deal. At four o'clock today, kids are gonna come around this corner and this barren piece of dirt you see right now, you're going to have turned into a kid's park for them. The children in this neighborhood do not have a park. They have nowhere to play. This, this was filled with all sorts of bad things very recently. And so we got off the bus and it's pouring down rain and you see huge piles of mulch, huge, pieces of gravel, loads of playground equipment, and a paint by numbers sort of design on the wall uh, on one of the buildings, really tall buildings. 
pouring down rain and we got to work. So everybody just started doing everything. There was a plan. You had people carrying wheelbarrows in the rain, falling down, eating a sandwich. They were so focused to get this thing done by four because we knew those kids were gonna walk around the corner. And the funny thing was, it was pouring all day again. There was a, a, a blocker over the wall so you could actually go paint when you were tired. And during the course, anybody ever done paint by numbers? You fill in a little bit of color and then slowly the picture comes to life. Well, during the course of the day, you would see that this picture on the wall, they were children playing in the park that you were making. And we came to learn these were the exact children that were gonna come around the corner. So you were motivated during the day, you saw the kids and families that were gonna benefit. Lo and behold, 40 minutes before we were done, the sun came out and everything stopped. The kids came around the corner and the parents came around with them. They had never seen a park in their town and they broke down in tears. The parents were beside, there's a moment I'll never forget in my life. The parents were, were just in tears and the kids were so happy running around to the park. It was an amazing moment. So then they gathered us together and they said, okay, let's talk about what this exercise meant to you. We're kind of like, wow, we were so exhausted. We were brain dead. And they're like, who emerged as the leader? I want to talk to who's the leader. And I'll kind of look around. And we're like, well, I don't know. There, there really wasn't a leader, right? And they're like, well, how did, you, how did you get the work done? It's like, we just figured it out and did it. We knew those kids were going to come around the corner. And we knew we had to get this done. And, you know, it starts to realize what they're saying. And the take-home message was, if you align a group of people around a mission and a vision, they absolutely see it clearly. And if they're driven by a purpose, our mission was to get the park done. Our purpose was to serve those children, the kids and their families. And we were working like crazy for it. When you have those two things, you don't need a manager to supervise. Them. So it reminded me and all my colleagues, I'll never forget this lesson. Your job as a senior leader is to really paint that vision and picture and have that purpose and then get out of the way for your people to, to execute. And if you do that, they'll do absolutely amazing. That's a beautiful story. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike, um, for giving us this opportunity, um, Mr. Costa. Um, uh, Mike, uh, my name is Ye, and my question for you um, in particular is in pharmaceutical con um, industry like Pfizer, what are important factors when you, um, you know, going to develop your business in other countries and what kind of like relationship you're dealing with, you know, local public health departments or like governments in growing business in international market? And do you have any, you know, good stories to share with us like um, Viagra or Embro or other products? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the question. Yeah, when you're dealing with International our bodies overseas that oversee, you know, different countries that the bodies that oversee the medicines and the supply and the approval. The number one thing you need to think about is collaboration with these government entities and these, we call them the authority for the most part. And it's absolutely critical that you engage with them early before the medicine is actually a medicine, because you have to explain to them what is the disease that you're trying to treat. And then you need to explain to them, because this doesn't work, they do all the time, they're very busy people say, okay, this disease causes this problem for a patient. So you paint out clearly what the patient is suffering with and how it changes their life and what it means to them, and to their families, to their work life, to their home life, and their productivity to society, right? So you explain that. Then finally, you say people living with these diseases cost society so much money, you make an estimate. So you say, because there are no effective treatments for this disease, this is costing society $590 million or pick the number when you do the math. And that's extremely important that they understand, you know, sort of what that is. And then you can sort of discuss, well, what value does this medicine bring? If you were to approve and pay for this medicine, those costs could go down significantly. Therefore, the patient wins. Society wins. They pay less overall for the cost of healthcare, And also it's good for Pfizer too. So that's at the crux of those discussions. And they're really important that you do them early. But also having um, relationships with these governments is absolutely critical because you've got to understand what their needs are. So you create a clinical trial that gives you data that allows that government to say it's worth it and we'll pay for it. And you know, I'll give you just uh, an example in Sweden. It's a different example. It's not about product, but it's about the industry. They had done the math in Sweden and anticipated that their pharmaceutical costs were going to go through the roof, increasing 14, 15, 16 every year, up, 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 up. 
And the fact of the matter is that that wasn't the case. So we got together as an industry, we had an industry association and got together with the government and there was trust developed over years. And we started to share with them all of our data and they were missing something. They were missing prices go up, you know, sales go up for drug, then they go generic and they go down to nothing. And another drug, they go up, then they go generic and then it disappears. Well, they had missed some of those. So they had overestimated the increase. So through collaborating with this country in this case, they realized that there was an error and um, we adjusted and said, look, it looks like pharmaceuticals are only going to grow by 4% and we'll guarantee it as an industry. So that was a win. The person in charge of managing that country's pharmaceutical budget had a huge win. They thought it was going to be here. Industry guaranteed them here. It was a win for us because we didn't have to endure an arbitrary price increase. And it was a win for patients because they were able to get the medicine that they wanted. So it's another example how in whatever country you're in, you really got to engage with the authorities in an entirely different way than I ever would have imagined when I was a U.S. marketing colleague. You know, I never would have anticipated that, but it's super important. I think that answer your question? Yeah, thank yeah. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Bar. So nice to see you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Yeah, I'm Jin Shen. And my question is like, what makes Pfizer different from other pharmaceutical companies? Uh, I think the, um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, the people in the culture, I think, are differentiators. Um, I can tell you this during the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to partner with over 30 companies. So when you partner with a company, sometimes you put marketing resources together and, and you know, sell the, the, the brand together. Sometimes you buy companies, all this sorts of things. And there are a few differentiating factors with Pfizer. And I think the biggest thing you see with Pfizer is we absolutely just go for it. We, we empower people. I will not name the company because I don't want to. <laughs> One of these companies, we were struggling because we were going for it and they were a bit more conservative. And they said, you know, in our company, we don't get into trouble for missing opportunities. What we get in trouble for is making a wrong call, going for something and failing. And then it was like a light bulb went off. We we're like, aha, that's the problem. We are the exact opposite. At Pfizer, you can get into, I use trouble loosely, you can get into trouble for not going for it and missing opportunities. You're not going to get in trouble for trying something that didn't work. Those are two fundamentally different cultures. I can tell you which one I want to work for. I want to be with the company that goes for it. And during my time at Pfizer, that's absolutely the case, and it's still the case. So, uh, no, thanks for the uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm going to focus on this. She's online, so she's online. My name is Rei Qi Li. Thank you for giving us this opportunity, Mr. Glassman. The question is, how does Pfizer do market research that is identify the needs of patients? Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the question. So Pfizer does market research a number of ways. First of all, there are, patient, there are patient advocacy groups that we work with. So if you are looking into a medicine that's going to help with the disease, you can find a patient advocacy group, a group that advocates for those patients. We connect with them and we begin to learn what is the patient journey like? How does that patient suffer? What does it mean to their quality of life? How do they do the things they wanna do? Are they in pain? We learn all of that from them. And Pfizer, um, when I left it, worked with well over 100 patient advocacy groups. On top of that, we'll do research with healthcare providers and ask them questions. When you say it's fibromyalgia is the disease, how do you know when someone has fibromyalgia? How do they feel? How do you treat them? What is that treatment course like? What medicines do you typically give them? How do they react? So we learn from the patient groups, the healthcare providers, we learn a lot of information that way. Then we also learn from patients. We'll do research and ask patients because understanding the patient is absolutely front and center at all times. It's the only way you can market, develop, or create a medicine is understanding that journey. So imagine you're a patient with chronic pain. We brought these patients in. They've participated in other focus groups and they sit in chairs like you are now. Are those really comfortable chairs? <laughs> maybe, maybe for an hour, but not for, not for a whole day. So we brought them in and we, we took a different approach. They had beds for those who needed to lay down. We had big 
comfortable chairs where the feet went up for some people who were in pain. We had massage therapists who could help if somebody was having a cramp and they stayed all day and the insights we got from them about their journey were through the roof and they were so thankful. They said, do you really understand us? And as a result, they told us so much more about their journey and that's how we, we do the research. And that, that's what ultimately gives us the information and data we need to do clinical trials that give the data that help those patients. And for instance, what we learned from patients in pain is, has anybody ever been to the doctor and they talk about a pain score on a scale of one to 10? You know, a lot of pain or a little pain. I did a talk on this once, but um, that doesn't mean a whole lot. When we talk to these patients, they're like, I don't care if I'm from a nine to a seven. I want to go up the stairs and put a shirt on, or I want to hold my child, or I want to hug my mom, or I want to carry something. So what we learned from them is to talk about function. And we want to talk to physicians about helping their patients get back to functioning and doing the things that they love to do. So all this comes in. Does that answer a question? Yeah. I think so. You know, you're really helping them out because your strategic plan is about how to grow sales, right, over the next 20 years. <laughs> so yeah, we have one more in, on this, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity. My name is so long. And you. my question is that we know how to estimate future growth for products like Advil uh, for Pfizer's consumer divisions. And uh, what we want to learn is that how does the pharma industry uh, including Pfizer makes growth estimates for prescription drugs. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. We in the pharmaceutical prescription side like to think Advil forecasting is a lot easier. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a great question. So when you think about how do you forecast growth, and I'll start with a brand new um, molecule that's gonna treat a disease where there really are no good treatment options. You find out how many patients have that disease worldwide, and we'll use the US as an example. So you find out, okay, Based on estimates, the CDC says that we may have 500,000 people in the US with this disease. So, okay, how many of those patients are diagnosed? 2%. Okay, so there's a big opportunity to increase diagnosis. The reasons oftentimes patients aren't diagnosed is because there's no treatment. What's the point? If you have a treatment, that's when physicians and healthcare providers really start to diagnose. So you've got 500,000, you're like, what percent is treated? 2%, I forget what I said before. Okay, if you were to get patients treated, what percentage of those patients would be appropriate for your drug? In this hypothetical case, it's for mild to moderate eczema or something. So then the patient funnel gets a little smaller, right? And then how many of those patients would be on competitive therapies? Because we believe we know what competitors will come out in two or three years when this drug is approved. So you start with the patient funnel, you look at the diagnosis, which brings it down smaller, What's the competitive set? What are the appropriate patients? And then you're left with the number of patients, which you can forecast from there. Where the growth comes from and where the art and science come together is when you're gonna say, okay, when there are treated diseases, most of the time that diagnosis rate is way higher than full. That's your growth. Year one, 10% of patients you think can be diagnosed. Year two, maybe you can get it to 20, 30, then ultimately something higher. And then the bigger that patient pool gets, the more it drives your the more it drives your revenue. And that's the, that's the key. And that's where pharmaceutical companies can really play a role because we'll try to educate physicians, healthcare providers, patients. That's why those ads are on TV. People can recognize, maybe I have that. I'll ask my doctor. Or the healthcare provider is going to medical education ceremonies like, I can recognize that patient. So you diagnose more patients. And in the end, the healthcare provider is happy because they're sort of solving a need for the patient that they they weren't able to before. Patients happy because they never knew that they had this disease and that there was a treatment and ultimately Pfizer benefits too. So that answer your question? Yes. Thank All you. right, thank you. Um, the next slide is from Kitchen. It's what you saw on the slide, right? And this is for any industry, right? What do you do um, manage, you know, which, which customers to prioritize? So go ahead, Kitchen. Mm -hmm. right. So thank you for being part of this opportunity and my name is Kershaw Ding and my question for today is when Pfizer developed the COVID vaccine the demand was huge because everyone wants a vaccine at that time so my question is how did the Pfizer choose to what country uh, to deliver first and what can other industry learn from it 
Yeah, I think the answer is a little more simple in this particular case of COVID because you had a few things um, working. You had a super cold, it required super cold freezers. Those freezers in the beginning weren't everywhere in the world until we tried to help fix some of that. Um, so then when you're looking about availability and short supply, who can get an emergency use authorization? Which countries can do that faster? So you don't just make a drug and then ship it somewhere and they use it. They, each country has a, 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 an authority that reviews it. They have their own process. And it's usually, you know, in some countries, it's several years. Well, now we wanted to do it very quickly. So countries that were best prepared to get an emergency use authorization quickly are the ones that got the product faster. If you look at the UK, they had a very quick process, so they got product. United States had a quick process, so they got product. But the goal through that was to increase production. And that was really the, the miracle of this whole thing, that our colleagues in manufacturing are really heroes because they didn't know that they were, they, they weren't sure how much they could produce. And in meetings, you would hear that they could produce 100 million doses. Wow, that's amazing from nowhere. And we had a very aspirational CEO working with them who was thinking billions, not millions. And um, Mike McDermott and his team were so innovative and so creative. Remember when I was talking about purpose earlier? Mm -hmm. They had a purpose. They didn't know if they could do this and manufacture it. So they found a way. And next thing you know, they were getting up 2 billion doses. Last year, we all three, uh, delivered 3 billion doses. This year will be four. So that's, that's how that happened. So thank you. Thank you so much. Things which are a bit tougher, right? All right. Yeah. <laughs> we can skip right over that. If my daughter's watching, you can sign off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Bill, would you put the slide? So, so the pharmaceutical industry is highly profitable, right? Basically, an investment has tripled in value, which is more than the stock market or housing, which is double. But it's much less than tech, right? Companies like Microsoft or Apple, they grew sevenfold. So when Pfizer decides that they are going to give two billion doses to developing countries at cost, you guys have like you know pressure from investors saying no, no, you you, you got to make more money. And how do you manage that? Pressure from investors never goes away, no matter what your product category is. Um, but the key thing here, and the key thing ever since I was associated with Pfizer, um, a couple of things rang true. Number one, the patient is front and center. The patient is first. Number two, we've always had, a Pfizer has always had a commitment to um, deliver med medicines to underserved markets and countries. And when you think about you know, a national, uh, a global pandemic, um, if you only solve it in a few countries, you know, then, then you still have a big problem on your hands. So Pfizer found numerous ways to help get that product to the places that needed to be. We work with the UPS Foundation, and that foundation delivered these sub-zero super cold freezers to certain mm -hmm. places. We worked with Zipline, um, a company that used actually drone service in Ghana to get medicines to remote locations. And then there's uh, Project Last Mile, which is an um, organization getting medicines, you know, that last mile to patients in Africa. So the commitment there was that we would, we would do everything within our power or Pfizer would do everything. I left them very recently, so it's already good enough. Um, so, uh, um, so everything in our power to get this medicine to the, the patients. And the belief is that if we put the patient first, then ultimately the benefit will come back to us. And that is um, something that our CEO, Albert Borla, was adamant about from the day he took over. And it's a belief installed all of us. So when we talk about new opportunities and products, did you notice, I, I don't think you ever heard me say money. I didn't say these many patients will give us so many dollars. It's just not the way we think, Pfizer, right? It's sort of like, how can we help these patients? And if we can find enough of them in need, then ultimately Pfizer, you know, it'll be good for Pfizer. And that's proven to be the case. So we also think that by doing these things and donating these products, it's good for patients. But for Pfizer, it's also good for the investor. Okay, I'm going to next question. It's a bit
Yes, and which used to cost more than four hundred and fifty dollars in China. And according to the CDC, the incidence of shingle is only zero point four percent. So on a social media platform, people argue that the farmer is promoting this job just to make money. So do you have any tips on how consumers can balance the information they receive to make better decisions? No, thanks for the question. It's a really good one. And I know Pfizer made an announcement with Bio BioNTech that they were going to look at an mRNA um, shingles vaccine that's not available uh, now. But the point is, is a very good one. And I think if the question is how to help consumers balance, it's really, really tough. Because the stat you produced was like CDC's incidence is point something, point four. Um, if you go to CDC's website, which, which I'm sure you would or did, you see that one in three patients in their lifetime will actually have shingles. So if a social media platform is taking a snippet, 0.4% seems like nothing, right? So you're like, wow, pharma's just trying to make money out there. Well, the reality is the CDC says one in three patients will actually get shingles. 10 to 18% of those patients will have something that, lifts, that, that, that lasts called PHN, which is basically nerve pain that lasts a very, very long time. So when you think about um, when you think about something like shingles as the example, I think it's such a good one that you brought up because I actually had shingles about less than a year ago. I am over fifty. I delayed getting my vaccine. I work for a company. You know, my bad. I learned my lesson there for sure. So I got shingles and the rash didn't show up, but I was in massive pain. So I went to. I thought I had hurt my back. So I went to an orthopedic surgeon who also thought I had messed up my back because it was severe pain. He gave me an MRI looking to see if my, he was, your back is fine. So we, lo and behold, the rash shows up, realize that it's shingles. And it is excruciating pain, excruciating pain. And all I could think about during that time is how dumb I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that, that crosses my mind. Kind of, oh, why didn't I get the vaccine? I was worried about being part of that 18, 10 to 18% because I couldn't fathom, couldn't understand that pain were to last a long time, what kind of quality, you couldn't sleep. Like what was the quality of my life speak? So I think the challenge for consumers is to sort out the 4% on social media from the reality of the one in three. And that comes, that's another area where pharmaceutical marketing, um, what we're talking about here can really, really play a big role because our goal is to educate on the facts. And if we would be doing a better job of educating one in three as an industry, I mean, by the time it's, but as, um, in about the one in three, then people would understand, oh, so among the three of us, which one of us three are going to get shingles? <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> Since I didn't get the shot. Did that answer your question? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, and it is in Europe, so you have also the ability to share feed on that. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you. My name is Omra and my question is that Enver costs about 80,000 per year. Whereas in Switzerland, where it costs about 7,200 per year. Whereas where Switzerland is a richer country and people over there are paid higher salaries. We learned in class about local, national, and global prices, but we couldn't figure out pharma. <laughs> <laughs> so, why are, why are prices in the US so much more higher? And are there any best practices that you learned by working on it? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. It's absolutely a great one. So when you look at list prices, particularly in the US for pharmaceuticals, it's extraordinarily deceiving. So if you look at uh, you know, the price you mentioned, uh, the $80,000, well, that's not the actual, I'm gonna not talk about Embril specifically, so I'll create a hypothetical here. Many of these high cost products or higher cost products, um, call it 80,000. Again, we're not talking Embril, but just in general, right? Um, in order to get that to the patient, that product is ultimately discounted multiple times through rebates, through middleman, through payers. Some of those discounts range as large as 50, 60, 70% in some categories. So the 80,000 doesn't represent the price that insurers or societies pay. So now you're left with a much lower number. But to your point, it's still higher than Switzerland. I don't care how you do the math, it's still higher than Switzerland. And what companies do is they ask themselves, first of all, Every country has a distant, different system and way of evaluating the value of pharmaceuticals. So in this case, Switzerland has a certain way. We do all the things we talked about earlier. Z state value in Switzerland says it's worth 7,200 or whatever figure you said. You're left with the decision as a drug company, do I deny those patients in Switzerland my medicine? Do I give it to them at 7,200? It's not what you want to do. If you do that, most companies probably supply the medicine. 
And that's why you wind up having um, you know, that sort of uh, disparity across the board. It is not a perfect system in any country, including the US. But it's important to note that when you think about drug costs in the US, it's oftentimes less than it is than people uh, would think. So it's about 14% of all healthcare system costs. And um, it has been growing at a rate for seven out of the last 10 years, growing at a rate slower than all of healthcare. For the next 10 years, it's projected to grow at about the same rate as healthcare. So it's not the biggest part of the expense, but it's the biggest part of the expense that drives savings throughout the whole, whole industry. And the good news is the U.S. is amongst the first countries to get innovation. We support innovation here through, um, through a number of means. And if you look at new medicines, we'll get those new medicines faster with more access than many, many other countries. And for fun, if you want to Google and, and look around, you'll find in many cases, response rates use cancer as an example. Now, as a result of some of these treatments, your, your survival rates and whatnot are higher in the U.S. than some other developed countries who maybe have different processes as well, because some of these countries that come up with these prices that we have to decide to go along with, sometimes it takes years, very long time. So thanks for the question. Not an easy one, tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get in farther. Oh, okay. There's a quarter of the There we go. Ms. Devyat Shah, thank you for giving us this opportunity, Mr. Gladstone. I would like to ask you one question. My question is that 27 million people in the United States don't have health insurance. What can the pharma industry do so that they don't have to pay list prices? Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the question. The pharma industry can do a lot. <clears throat> First of all, most companies have what we call patient assistant programs. These are compassionate use medicines for patients that don't have insurance or they don't have uh, low income or employment. Most companies have those sort of programs available. In addition to that, you've got uh, coupons, uh, you know, things to help them afford medicines. But also use the example that, that was used about the medicine that cost $80,000. Many cases that only costs the patient $10 a month because of insurance, everything like that. So. Uh, companies can help by providing use for those patients, who can, uh, compassionate use for those patients who can't afford it, coupons and discount to bring their out-of-pocket cost very low. There's a lot more that pharmaceutical companies can do. There, we have product category called biosimilars. So when you take uh, your normal pill, your Eliquis, it's a small molecule, it's in a pill you swallow it, biologicals or biologic medicines or vaccines, and you usually inject those. Well, you can't really have a generic to those because you can't find something identical, exactly the same, but it's a biological. So you have something that's you know, similar. They call those biosimilars. It's essentially like generic competition for large molecule you know, sort of biologic medicines. And we can go a long way toward increasing the utilization of those biologic medicines. So when you have a pill, small molecule, when that goes generic, that's a gift to society. The price goes down to nothing, a million people manufacture it, you know, it's healthy, it's good, it's fine, it's our industry. But with, with these biologic medicines, there's some hesitancy to use biosimilars because it's not the same. So what we can do is educate uh, healthcare providers that you know, this, these are safe medicines that could be used. They're gonna be way cheaper uh, in many cases than the brand medicine. But consumers also have to understand, hold on a minute, this is not the same thing. Wait a minute, it's not like switching out to generic. They need to understand that it's safe. At the same time, payers need to understand that they need to reimburse and pay for these medicines. So we engage in, in the industry significant lobbying to try to have some government actions to, to enable the use of biosimilars in a more effective way. So that's something we are doing and can do to drive uh, you know, patient costs down as well. <clears throat> there are other things. Um, right now, when we contract, we work with a big entity, a, a payer of some sort, and we agree to sell it at a certain price based on the competitive scenario or whatever they're demanding. Um, we're moving toward slowly, but we'll get there to value-based pricing in the United States, where you can talk to a payer and say, this pill is going to add this amount of value. Um, it's gonna reduce your cost by $10 million, therefore we can charge you a million dollars to serve all these patients. So we're moving to something a bit more value-based 
Um, so those are a few things we can do, but it's not, it's not gonna be done by one company, one industry. It needs to be a collaboration so that the healthcare providers, the consumers, the payers and government are all aligned in ways to help drive some of these down. So the value base is more the European system. Pardon me? That is more like the European system, right? A little European closer, system. Yeah. a little closer, but the European, the European isn't necessarily value based. It's similar. Yeah, I'll just yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, exactly. It's similar enough. Yeah. yeah. Super. Well, thank you very much. That was thank you. the end of all the hard questions, but you're building a bridge for the question from Patricia. Yes. Well, that's a setup. That means if I blow the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, my question is last year Pfizer spent uh, two billion dollars on advertising and pledged to provide one billion dollars of COVID nineteen vaccine to like at a not per, per profit price. How can some of those advertising resources be used to convince those who are hesitant to get their vaccination or annual boosters? And how um, do you think that for those of us who are taking our master's in marketing, should we apply to a pharmaceutical company? Absolutely, thanks for those, uh, for those questions. First of all, the vaccine is under an emergency use, author use authorization, which, which limits the way you can do marketing and traditional advertising. So that's why you're seeing um, a, a bit of a different approach there. And Pfizer's approach to vaccine hesitancy is through the science, through, through the science to understand real world data so people can understand the safety and efficacy. But for the rest of our portfolio that has a full approval, you can advertise and put full efforts behind. And I can um, tell you that pharmaceutical marketing is one of the, I, I am biased, one of the best places to do marketing on planet Earth because it's so engaging. And there's nothing wrong with selling um, screws or soda, right? That's super challenging and stuff. The things that make pharmaceutical marketing different is, um, there would be the fact that number one, it's, it's purpose driven, right? I mean, when you think about the things that you can do to impact patients' lives, let's give you an example. When a patient has um, atrial, atrial fibrillation, they can oftentimes have a stroke because the blood clot can form and it goes straight to the brain. Matter of fact, many people find out they have, a, they have AFib by having a stroke first. So if you're a marketing person for that brand and you figure out diagnosis rates are low because people, my dad has AFib. The only reason he found out is he was having a knee surgery. He might've been one that had a stroke, but he was just lucky. So as a marketing person, what can we do? Hmm, what is everybody wearing around their wrists right now? We can partner with companies like you know, uh, Fitbit and those that can monitor rhythmias like that and get back to the doctor. What if you were the person that helped come up with that idea or execute it? And millions of people have AFib that are undiagnosed. What if that meant hundreds of thousands of people get diagnosed? I wonder how many lives you would save. That's a pretty fulfilling proposition. That's just one example, we've got loads of them. So that's the fulfilling purposeful part. When we get out of bed, that's what I think about. I used to make stadiums full uh, you know, demonstrations of people that have been helped and what the dinner tables would look like if our medicines would be there, an empty seat, you know, those sort of things. But also, it's fun because you're engaging with world thought leaders in, in medicine in different areas. So in marketing, pharmaceuticals, it starts way back in the lab. And some of our clinicians are the best marketing positioners you'll ever find. That's weird. That was new to me. They, they weren't trained in this stuff. But you know, if you're making a medicine and you're in the early stages and going to put it to people, you kind of have to think, well, who is this for and how is it going to be used? So our people are now working with their clinical development team on the early stages to make sure that clinical trials are made in such a way that it benefits patients and we can communicate it in such a way. So I, and you, you know, I've dealt in, during my early marketing days, you're at the table with world leading cardiologists and you're having a discussion, learning from them. And then you take that knowledge, you go apply it and figure out how to impact patients. I think it's the greatest thing in the whole world, but I might be a little biased. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes, but you missed one question. Uh -oh. <laughs> For those of us doing marketing, do you think we should apply to a pharmaceutical company? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Time's done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's questions. Um, I think Eva, you asked on behalf of Cecilia. No, Cecilia, yeah. perfect. You're here. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, so that you guys know, once I was in your shoes, right? Once I was an international student, and back then, Procter and Gamble did hire international students. Go ahead, Cecilia. Okay. Let's go. Sorry, I 
Maria. My question today is how do global companies benefit from hiring international students? <laughs> Next question. <I> know. <laughs> Thank you for the question. That's great. Um, I think the first thing to think about is my my previous role, 58 countries, only one of them was the US. So first and foremost, looking at international students, hugely important. And I think if I'm a company, I'm looking for international students for a couple of reasons. We oftentimes have US marketers who grew up in the US and they, they know the US very well, and then they grow on to become global marketers. That's really tough if you've never been lived or been in another country to sort of figure out and understand what's happening there. An international student comes in with a big advantage because you've got a you've got a perspective that is not like this. It's like this, and um, uh, you know. So companies are looking for you. You are in hot demand. International students. I lived overseas for six years, a couple of different countries, and there were some of the really developmental times. And the one thing I would say is, as an international student coming in, try to be balanced because. In a lot of these big companies, you have a lot of U.S. focused people who don't have international experience. Make sure you're not only an international student, but you give international experience and U.S. experience, because pretty soon you become a unicorn. Like during my career, a lot of people, when I went over overseas, I didn't know what I was doing. It was a challenge. Came back, I knew a lot more stuff. So then when I was competing for higher level positions, I was competing against people who only had U.S. experience, and it became um, a, bit, a bit easier to acquire those sort of positions. So. Yes, you're needed, you know, love it, go for it, have a ball. Companies need international international marketing students and students in general like crazy. So thanks. Thank you. 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 Employees and uh, should female employees like like students like me to apply for right? Yeah, integrity, integrity, and excellence. Or integrity, excellence, and attitude are the three things that I look for more than anything. If you have excellence and no integrity, I have no time for you. Right? If you have a great attitude and no excellence, kind of the same thing. Only it's harder to say. You know. So you need all three of these things. This is what we're looking for. And I think now is a perfect time for women in particular to join pharmaceutical companies in general, because um, there's a need, particularly at the senior levels, for more women in, in pharma at a higher level. And pharmaceutical companies are advancing women at a higher rate. Um, companies like Pfizer, Pfizer had a goal to get to a certain level of, of VPs in the company. So female, um, female key talent, that's the key thing. Key talent, killing it, doing great, are going to be accelerated, not only in Pfizer, which they are, but in other companies. And I can tell you, Pfizer has a specific program called Women Inspiring Women, one of many programs, which is where women who are a little higher in the organization, women who are a little lower in the organization, very frequently and share ideas and thoughts. And just some of the, uh, some of the simple things, like um, all the research shows that women will not typically apply to a role unless they've met all the qualifications. The man sitting right next to him will apply if he has half of those qualifications. That's not like a stare. That's an actual true thing. So when I work it with women in our organization, I'm like, when you're looking at a job description, don't worry about the five things you don't have. Worry about the five things you do. And there are some, some differences like that that are really important for, I think, women to, to keep in mind. Also, the research will show that women are less likely to raise their hand to do those things. So we had an initiative called Raise your hand just to remind people to get up there and get after it. So now's a great time to do it. Companies are super interested because diverse workforces, diverse thoughts make for much better, much better work environments, but much better business outcomes too. And I don't want to run too far, but I have another idea. Time for a quick one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a drug that was for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. This is about diversity in general, not necessarily. About women. Um, drug's been launched for years. We had a colleague who figured out that African-Americans suffered from peripheral pain from nerve pain, and they were um, being diagnosed at a much lower rate. So we came up with a plan to reach those patients. We hired um, uh, Cedric the Entertainer to do, a, to do, a, to do you know, public service, and we saw diagnosis rates go through the roof. So we were all celebrating. We were like super happy that this had happened because great for these patients, great for society. Pfizer did really well in this. And one of the colleagues in the group said, 
yeah, this is great. But imagine if we would have had a diverse team a few years ago and we would have done this at launch. I wonder how many patients we missed. I think it's a brilliant example of why diverse teams make such a difference. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Encouraging women to work. Great. Yeah, and uh, one of my classmates would like to know more details about your career, but she cannot like come ah, today. Okay. So, uh, what was the most significant challenge during career advisor, and most importantly, any career advice for us? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks for the question. So, there's a, I'll, I'll talk about a, a challenge and then a crisis because I think they're two different things. So, challenge. One of the biggest challenges I had was going overseas to work. From the U.S., grew up in the U.S. You know, went on vacation overseas, but didn't live in. So uh, I read four. I started out in the Nordics before I went to all of Europe and, and Asia, and I uh, read fourteen books on culture before I went to Sweden, which is where I was going to live. So um, and it sort of just to confuse me further. But um, <laughs> so, so the biggest challenge was operating in a completely different culture. Even though they speak English really well, it's it's sort of puts you to sleep because you think it's the same culture. Um, and uh, learning to, um, to work with different groups and also learning to have somebody tell you the truth. So Magnus Wasian was a guy that I said, your job is to tell me when I am doing wrong. Like, I'm not going to get all the cultural mistakes that I'll make, but you've got to tell me. So that was super important. He'd be like, you did this. And I'm like, I don't get it because that gives a bad impression. But I don't know. My U.S. brain didn't know that. So that was a big challenge and I loved it, man. I'm a, I'm a culture junkie. I love going to different places and communicating in a way that resonates with that audience, which is different than a way than when you're in the UK versus Japan, two different ways to communicate. Love it, love it, love it. So when it comes to other challenges like crisis, I can probably walk you through um, an example, but I think the, the way I would probably think about managing crisis is this. They're gonna happen and typically what happens is when a crisis occurs, people panic. This can be, um, you know, a competitive situation that creates a disaster. People are worried in marketing teams, oh my gosh, am I going to have a job? If you're a sales rep, oh my gosh, there are 3,000 sales reps that could be affected by this thing that just happened and people get into panic mode. And then they start working and they start talking and they become super unproductive. So the first thing I would say, whether you're an individual colleague or whether you're a leader in a crisis, is step back for a moment. And I learned this um, trick from, uh, I was kind of doing it before, but it solidified it. A friend of mine, Mike, Michael Hayes, he's a, um, he was a Navy SEAL commander. He's a White House fellow. He's a true American hero. And what he learned in the Navy SEALs was when something happens, the first decision you have to make is when to make a decision, right? I see a lot of heads turning. I got to think about that for a moment. So when a crisis hits, we immediately spring into action, step back. I do this all the time. Okay, wait a minute. When do we have to make a decision here? And you have to chart in your mind and actually spend some time thinking about time to make a decision gives you more information. So you're going to make a better decision. But there's a time, point in time when wasting time costs you more money. So you have to find the, the cross point between the incremental value of waiting versus the cost that that, that waiting is going to, to, to give you. And then when you know that intersection, you know when you have to make a decision. So you say, okay, I've got three weeks to make a decision. That informs everything else you do. You say, okay, here's information I need to find out in order to make a great decision. And you can put a timeline on it and do that and make great decisions. So that is first and foremost, because that takes the pressure off of everybody. Instead of running around like circles, it's like, okay, we've got two weeks. We've got four hours. Make the decision then. The second thing is whether you're an individual contributor or a leader, when crisis happens, and it can mean a thousand things to it in different businesses, from the Tylenol issue to, to everything. So when it hits, number one, you've got to eliminate the stress for people. When people get worked up, nervous, concerned about themselves, their future, the business, everything, everything tightens up. You feel it in your stomach, right? I can almost feel it as I sit here. You have to, <laughs> I really, I, I'm working myself up into a friend. So you've got to relieve that tension ASAP. I tend to do it with humor. And if you're an individual, you don't have to be the leader to do it. You can still take things very seriously. And, and you know, I'll explain to people sometimes who are wondering why we're laughing in the face of this mess. You lose your creativity when you're under stress. You do not have the ability to innovate. You do not think out of the box and come up with wild solutions because that comes from having fun and thinking, well, okay, this is a disaster. Let's figure this out. So you've got to relieve the stress for your peers or if you're the leader, 
you've got to do it for the team. And it's okay to explain to people. It's okay if we, you know, sort of laugh and have some fun here. I have seen teams spiral into no man's land when crisis occurred because they couldn't get out of the sport. Because it's hard. Life is hard. Challenges, crises are no fun. So that's probably the key thing to think about when it comes to, you know, challenges. And yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. So I would like to thank um, you know everyone at NYU. I'll be uh, do this. That will be very uh, met in the beginning. Have Patrick and Phil on the back. And then we get something that uh, both Cecilia and Eva were the editors, but that all the students participated on. And so, you've joined a live finance for marketing decisions class at NYU School of Professional Studies. In our class, we select a Fortune 500 company to learn about finance by making decisions on pricing, headcount, marketing, and profitability. CFOs and CMOs from Disney, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's have joined us to respond to questions from the audience. All speaker sessions are free and open to everyone. And today, over 50 students got together to say, When we were doing the assignments, We are reconnaissance to have this chance, Mr. Gladstone. On behalf of all students from New York, to North Carolina, and Europe to Asia. That was so heartwarming to see. And I want to thank all of you for the engagement and the questions. I was really looking forward to this. And now I got to get a report card from my daughter, whether I did a, a good job or not. But thank you so much for that. I've never felt so uh, such a warm welcome. And, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.